and welcome to the LSE. Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Um, welcome to this very exciting event on globalization and authoritarianism. My name is Mary Caldor, and I'm Professor of Global Governance here at the London School of Economics and Director of the Civil Society and Conflict Research Unit. Um, so I'm going to start by introducing everybody, and then I will hand over to Luke and Guy, who are the authors of the report we're going to discuss today. So Guy Atchison, who on my screen is next to me, um, is lecturer in politics and international studies at Loughborough University and co-author of the new report, COVID-19 and the new authoritarianism. Luke, who's two down, actually they all have their names on so you can all see who they are. Luke Cooper um, is associated with my research unit uh, and also co-author of the report and many other things, podcast maker and another Europe is possible. Uh, Nadine El Enami is a senior lecturer and co-director of the Center for Research on Race and Law um, and author of Debordering Britain, Law, Race and Empire. So welcome, Nadine. And finally, Shalini Randira, who is the director of the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna and also Professor of Social Anthropology and Sociology at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva, and the Director of the Albert Hirschman Center, something that's very relevant to all our discussions as Hirschman did so much about voice and democracy. So, um, so now I'm going to, oh, just before I introduce Luke and Guy to tell us about the report and then Nadine and Shalini are going to comment on it. I need to tell you that for Twitter users in the audience, the hashtag for today's events is at LSE COVID-19, all one word. And the online event is being recorded and we hope it will be available as a podcast. Um, and as usual, there'll be a chance for you to submit your questions through the Q&A feature at the bottom. Please let us know your name and your affiliation um, as people really like to know. And we're very keen to hear from students, alumni and incoming students. And you can find the report we're launching today at www.lse.ac.uk slash CCS. CCS stands for the Conflict and Society Research Unit. So having given you all those preliminaries, let us hand over to Luke and Guy to present the report. Hi everyone, um, it's great to see so many people here and I'm really uh, looking forward to the discussion. Uh, the report is a compilation of observations and it's part of an ongoing research project. It's not a final statement, it's very much a work in progress, uh, but it contains a big warning about the future of the global system and the trend that was already present prior to this crisis towards authoritarian government. Um, there is uh, no reason for believing, nothing inevitable, however, but no reason for believing that this will change in the post-virus world, this existing trend to authoritarian government. And at best, we can say we're at a pivot point in history, a hinge moment where history could go in a number of different directions, where reactionary and progressive outcomes are both possible uh, at this current conjuncture. And while the future is certainly uncertain, we ha can have a good idea about it from studying the current trajectories of the international system. And I think we can broaden this out a little bit more, this argument, by saying that, well, all of the big moments of social transformation we've seen in the world system over the last uh, three or four decades, 1989, 2001, 2008, for example, 
the peaceful revolutions in the Soviet Union, 9-11, and the financial crisis of 2008. What happens at each of those crises, I would argue, is that the balance of forces and the ideas lying around shapes what happens next. And so they're not uh, moments where the past is one thing and then you get a year zero afterwards and a completely new and different direction. Um, So that's why I think we should be particularly concerned right now in the COVID-19 coronavirus crisis about the trend that has developed over the last uh, decade or so. And that's towards, as I said, um, very authoritarian government. And what the report tries to do is lay out what some of the drivers of change will be across this uh, moment. And the first one, I think, is the changing relationship of capitalist elites uh, to the state. And I think you can see this as a kind of end of free market economics, if you like, and the emergence of a very, very state dependent capitalism. Um, The capitalism that we have now is incredibly dependent on state subsidy. Uh, This fact, I think, has been clear since the 2008 financial crisis, but it's undeniable in the face of the coronavirus crisis of 2020. In 2008, we had bank bailouts, we had quantitative easing, and I would argue that these uh, these state bailouts had a particular logic to them. They prioritised capital over labour, and they had a really big economic effect. They promoted asset price inflation afterwards that tended to benefit those with capital and policies like austerity uh, hit labour, hit workers, uh, suppressed wages. And the end result, as Thomas Piketty has shown in his um, landmark book, is spiralling inequality. When capital returns are outrunning returns on wages, the end result is a massive uh, rise in inequality. Now, this in itself is not unusual in neoliberalism. From the 1980s onwards, I think you can always see these trends to what Guy Standing and others call a rentier capitalism. Um, It it has always been, despite the language of free markets, very dependent on the state. But I think 2008 and even more so 2020 take this to a whole new and different uh, level to the point where I think it's quite reasonable to talk about the end of neoliberalism as a result of the policies that we've seen now. Now, here's the caveat for those of us who are quite keen on the idea of ending neoliberalism. Uh, The end of neoliberalism is not necessarily a good thing. Uh, So we have, I think, two clear choices um, that are laid out as a result of this crisis now. Uh, One choice could be that we take advantage of this crisis um, to restore an equilibrium between labour and capital to develop a state managed economy where the public sector and the private sector work together and where we radically restructure our economy to put climate justice and social justice at the centre of it. And that would mean turn it on its head, the Piketty problem of capital benefiting in a a asymmetric way compared to labour. Or we have another option ahead of us in this situation too, and that is that we could mobilise colossal amounts of state intervention to protect the existing very high inequality system that favours capital over labour. And this is what we call in the report state dependent financialization. You keep the whole show on the road by mobilising massive amounts of state resources. Now, here's where the link to, I think, authoritarianism comes in. So say that you want to defend the existing model, and you're looking around to the political system for allies to do so. Well, who would you look to? I think the answer, and we know this, I think, from the experience of the of the last decade, that we see an uneasy alliance that is increasingly forming around that defence, because there are forces out there who don't talk very much, if at all, about regulating international finance and putting greater control on capital that don't talk about tax ha- closing down tax havens and taking big measures to uh, constrain financial criminality and whose critique of globalization tends to focus on its alleged multiculturalism its supposed rootless cosmopolitanism and its mass immigration 
i.e. these are the politics of ethnic nationalism and authoritarianism. And we have a range of case studies now, unfortunately, of what this looks like in power. It involves the blurring of distinctions between the public and private sphere. It mobilizes uh, state resources to benefit um, chosen allies. And it closes down uh, what uh, the political scientist John Keane uh, calls monetary democracy, the capacity of the state to regulate itself in the public interest. And they do all this, and they've done all this in a range of states through mobilizing discourses of ethnic nationalism and toxic uh, masculinity. And the real risk then with COVID-19 is that you can find lots in, of raw material for authoritarianism in the current crisis. Because say, if you were an authoritarian and you wanted to promote your political project in the face of this crisis, you would say, well, look, the, the first thing that cultural globalization did for us was mass immigration. The second thing was uh, the 2008 uh, financial crisis. And the third thing was coronavirus. So they have a ready-made, if you like, arsenal and toolkit ideolo ideologically to respond um, to this crisis. Finally, then, um, what do I think are the implications of these two choices that we essentially face? Well, I think one thing we can say about them, either choice, is that actually they both involve quite a lot of retrenchment away from globalization. Um, this is already happening uh, organically in the way that capitalism is working. Things like financial flows are down, have never recovered through their, two, their 2008 level. Uh, trade, foreign direct investment um, also down. So in a way, this thing that we could call deglobalization, states and regions becoming more important, uh, your local economy, if you like, to the global economy, that's already happening. And this was happening prior to the crisis of 2020. And so now in the course of this crisis, we get these huge interventions, unprecedented in peacetime. And what's the actor doing those interventions? Well, the actor is uh, nation states primarily, although that's more complicated in the special case of the European Union. But state aid is being normalized. And this means that deglobalization, a kind of unraveling of the global economy is happening, whether we like it or not. So that creates a very clear choice, I think. We can have a progressive retrenchment away from the hyper-globalization of the last four decades. We can protect international organizations um, have, by having a managed deglobalization, de what we call in the report a multilateralist deglobalization. And that's really important because that will allow us to have more democracy over our economy because it will come closer to the states and regions where people live. Or more dangerously, and I'm afraid we'd probably have to say also more likely outcome, is that we have a kind of nationalistic and authoritarian deglobalization, one characterized by trade wars. We get an indication of that, what that looks like already with the conflicts between China and the United States, beggar thy neighbor economic policies, and a deepening domestically and internationally of ethnic uh, nationalism. So a kind of nationalistic unraveling of the global economy. I believe broadly that that's the choice that coronavirus poses to everyone. Sorry, everybody, I was muted. Um, thank you very much, Luke, and I'll go straight on to Guy. Okay, thank you, Mary. Uh, thanks, Luke, and thanks everyone for joining us this afternoon on this hot, scorching day. Um, so I'm going to be talking a bit about Britain and the context here with the Boris Johnson government. So one of the things we draw attention to in the report, as Luke says, is the way in which the coronavirus crisis and the dynamics that it has unleashed has superimposed themselves onto a world in which there was already an existing trend towards authoritarian nationalism. And in the UK, we face an unenviable position, of course, of a 
self-inflicted double-pronged crisis with Brexit and the coronavirus crisis. So Brexit alone implies massive upheavals in how the country is governed. And in combination with the coronavirus crisis, you're seeing a very disorientating, destabilizing double crisis that interacts with uh, one another in complex ways. So, of course, Johnson won his extraordinary general election victory uh, in December last year. And in that time, people were already warning about the tendencies towards authoritarianism in Johnson's government and in some of the policy commitments in the Tory manifesto. So I won't go over everything that happened in the run up to the Article 50 deadline last year, but you'll remember that, of course, the Johnson government suspended Parliament. They threatened to uh, break the law from the Supreme Court. They purged the moderate One Nation wing of their party. They engaged in disinformation, fake news throughout the election campaign. And then they went into that election with a set of manifesto commitments, which were deeply uh, worrying um, when it comes to the constitutional and democratic checks that make up a uh, modern mature constitutional government. So obviously, Johnson won his election victory and he seemed to be riding high and he'd mobilized a critical swathe of voters behind his populist uh, politics. But then the coronavirus happened and he initially tried to strike a tone of uh, consensus of one nation Toryism, emphasizing the role of scientific expertise in guiding government policy but he also deployed some of the more simplifying uh, populist techniques, which he is known for. So the government was very much engaged in a kind of attempt to talk in simple sound bites when it came to presenting their management of the crisis. They weren't being upfront about the likely trade-offs, about the likely reality and seriousness of the crisis. There was a kind of breezy flag-waving optimism that has been a uh, common theme throughout the Johnson handling of this pandemic. And that's really jarred with the reality of the crisis. So Johnson won his get Brexit done election on the basis of polarizing the electorate and cutting through the complexity of the Brexit issue with a simple three word slogan. But that doesn't work quite as well with coronavirus crisis. It's a very complex crisis and it interacts with people's lived experience through the lockdown, they can see what's happening. And there's also an indisputable reality to the crisis, which can see, be seen in the statistics of excess deaths and mortality rates. And the UK is now in the position of having the worst excess death rate in the world. Um, and Johnson's popularity started to go down, you'll recall, round about the time when the Britain became one of the worst countries in terms of its high death toll in Europe and the messaging became more and more ambiguous and confusing for people when he said that people should stay alert to control the virus and people lost trust in government. There was a number of high profile efforts around PPE and so on. So he's seen a big drop in his approval ratings and there's also been rumblings of discontent from backbench Tory MPs. So some people are starting to say that Boris Johnson's um, position is, is, is difficult and that he may not last the year given how badly he's mishandled this crisis. But what you've also seen in the past few weeks is a shift back onto this kind of more populist authoritarian terrain that he's most comfortable with. So you've seen um, the government recently uh, scrapped the Department for International Development. They've went back on Theresa May's commitment for legal reform to allow gender self-identification. They tried to engage in culture wars around the Winston Churchill statue. And Johnson really thrives in that atmosphere. And when, when people point out the way in which his approval has gone down, what I find most striking of all is the way in which there's a solid 40% of people who are behind the Conservative Party, even given the indisputable catastrophe of its mismanagement of this crisis. So he's still in a strong position. He's got an 80 strong majority. Labour faces a massive uphill battle to overcome uh, that majority. And he has the solid support of the Brexit backing right wing press and a solid support of 
voters mobilized by this kind of culture war narrative. And in that context, I think it's important to pay attention to some of the commitments of the Tories in their manifesto and some of the tendencies we've seen. So in a infamous um, section of the manifesto, page 48, there were plans to look at the broader aspects of the British constitution, including the role of the courts, the role of parliament, and the Human Rights Act. And the, they're very vague about what this entails, but it essentially amounts to a new constitutional settlement. We could call it a new populist constitutional settlement that is gonna centralize power in the hands of the prime minister, restoring discretionary power to him. Um, and it's going to curb the power of judicial review and the power of the courts it's going to reduce the autonomy and independence of parliament that was so frustrating for them in getting Brexit done. And this kind of narrative, this authoritarian tendency is being pitched in the Brexiteer terms of the people versus the liberal elites. So parliament and the courts are blamed for frustrating Brexit. Judges are blamed for um, upholding human rights. So we face a government that's committed to dismantling legal protections for human rights and privacy just at a time when the British state is assuming massive power over all of our lives, including the construction of obviously a surveillance database through the attempt to uh, implement this track and test system. So there's some very worrying tendencies here. They still have four years of legislative um, time on the agenda and in Britain it's possible for a government with a majority to radically redraw the constitutional architecture of the country because Westminster operates as many people have pointed out as an elective dictatorship with a simple majority you can actually transform the very nature of the constitutional system so as Johnson's popularity has gone down we shouldn't assume that some of these tendencies have gone and he may turn to more comfortable grounds of this kind of polarizing culture war narrative uh, and, and that seems to go down well with a large number of voters i mean i'll just finish on the positive note we've also seen uh, some very positive and, and democratic uprisings against that with the black lives matter movement and there is a critical constituency of people who are interested in imposing this kind of racial divisiveness and the scapegoating of migrants, which uh, Boris Johnson has been um, known for. So I think I'll leave it there, but that's what I wanted to draw attention to, the sort of authoritarian latent tendencies and the ways in which they're interacting with the coronavirus crisis is very dangerous. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, am I still, am I muted? Somebody said I should do. No, you weren't muted, Mary, but now you are. Am I muted now? No. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, good. So let me now, everybody's been very good about time. Let me now turn to Nadine. Thanks, Mary. And thank you. Comments. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. And thank you to Guy and Luke for inviting me to comment on this report. Um, uh, yours is a very timely and welcome intervention. It is, of course, crucial to be interrogating and documenting the rise of authoritarianism um, that we've seen globally over recent years, and especially at a time where, as you say, the COVID-19 health crisis has seen the introduction of chances of new measures which are designed to strengthen executive power and control over people's lives. The authoritarianism of late, or um, as Luke and Guy put it, the rebalancing of power in favour of the executive, which is exacerbated in the post-Brexit political landscape, is characterised, um, we find, by growing and insistent calls to send in the army. And this is a point that my co-authors and I make in our forthcoming book, Empire's Endgame, Racism and the British State. In March 2019, then UK Defence Secretary Gavin Williamson said that the UK armed forces stand ready to intervene in the knife crime epidemic and that the Ministry of Defence is always ready to help any government department. A year later, at the outset of an actual epidemic, the Daily Express reported that up to 20,000 military personnel are being put on standby in a new COVID support force that could backfill police counterterrorism roles, act as prison guards or help with border force checks. We find that the army is habitually called upon to defend the nation in times of existential crisis. It is assumed to have a special ability to distinguish between full citizens and hidden enemies. If the structures of entitlement are in disarray, 
the army promises to be among the last institutions to know who is really the us that deserves protection and who requires exclusion, expulsion or incarceration. The call for an authoritarian response is a rejection, as Guy and Luke note in their report, of human rights and the varied procedural protections of civil society. For all the rhetoric of choice in a neoliberal economic and social system, the call for authoritarianism as a solution is revealing of the fear that there are no meaningful or effective social agents or collective outlets for action in sight. At the same time, calls for paramilitary intervention to deal with social problems or perceived social problems are reinforced by a widespread social obligation to honor the armed forces and official versions of their history. The compulsory requirement that we honor, respect and remember our boys constructs the soldier as the model British citizen, which is a central tenet of militarism, itself a reassertion of the nation. In Britain, we can observe since the 2003 invasion of Iraq, a concerted effort to ensure the armed forces are honored, memorialized and made visible and erased from official commemoration of war is the anti-war se sentiment that ran through so many political and cultural responses of people who lived through the time of the conflict. And I suppose the point that I want to make by bringing up some of these sort of more recent imperial histories of, of, of Britain is to say that this context of imperial war which has its roots in Britain's overtly colonial era is crucial to understanding seemingly recent or so-called new turns to authoritarianism. Luke and Guy note in passing that Britain has failed to deal with its colonial past, but it is in fact, if this fact that if examined allows us to see that the authoritarianism of today is an echo of authoritarianism past rather than something new altogether. The Britain of today cannot be understood, analyzed and responded to with transformative agendas without a reckoning with its past. Indeed, if its colonial history and that of its recent imperial invasions were to be put front and center, Britain would be understood not as a legitimately bordered sovereign nation state, but as an ongoing colonial entity in which racialized people in and outside its seemingly post-imperial borders continue to be made subject to the most brutal forms of state racial terror. I paused at the line in the report that says that Britain has a relatively long standing parliamentary democracy um, and that the country successfully escaped the dark spells of dictatorship that befell many European states in the 20th century. I understand that this is presented in contrast with the fascist histories of some of Britain's European neighbors, but I could not help but hear in this line the unlikely echo of Conservative MP Liam Fox's infamous tweet of March 2016 at the height of the Brexit debate that the United Kingdom is one of the few countries in the European Union that does not need to bury its 20th century history. Racialized people in and outside Britain know all too well what it feels like to be at the receiving end of British authoritarian rule. While it is true, as Luke and Guy note, that the scapegoating of migrants for economic inequalities is a divisive tool, we know that the British establishment's divide and rule tactic was honed much further afield in the course of its colonial exploits. The deregulatory reforms entailed in austerity policies, policies that we've heard a bit about today, including cuts to vital welfare services imposed with disastrous consequences across Europe following the 2007-8 financial crisis, are, as Diamond Eshiagbo has argued, medicine first trialed on the global south since the 1970s. Ashiagbo notes that European states are experiencing this as a category error, in part because they have not been on the receiving end of such policies, which are all too familiar in the global south. In the same way, we might experience rising authoritarianism as a category error in a place like Britain. However, Britain can only be understood as a place hitherto untouched by authoritarian rule if we excise, from its, if we excise it from its past colonial and recent imperial exploits. As Carl Sharrow put recently on Twitter, the British are finally experiencing what it's like to have the British rule their country. The rising domestic authoritarianism today can thus only be understood in this historical context. The vote to withdraw from the European Union and calls for the curbing of parliamentary democracy in favor of executive power in order to facilitate the ejection of people who do not fit or are not perceived as belonging in a so-called Brexit Britain must be understood as having its roots in Britain's colonial history. And of course, it's more recent imperial history. If we look at the 2003 invasion of Iraq and how it led to the death of more than 2 million people and destabilized the region for, for which its inhabitants continue to pay the price, it was driven as Paul Gilroy has observed 
by imperial nostalgia and misplaced notions of grandeur, arguably the very same rhetoric that oiled the wheels of a Brexit campaign, which sought to make Britain great again. Britain is thus reaping what it sowed. The legacies of British colonialism have never been addressed, including that of racism. The prevalence of structural and institutional racism in Britain not only made it fertile ground for the effectiveness of the Brexit campaign's rhetoric of taking back control, but also for the eugenicist response to COVID-19. Luke and Guy note that Boris Johnson's temptation to take the virus on the chin and let it move through the population, to use Johnson's words, um, is, is a significant um, indication of the current political um, tendency of this government. I would argue that this is demonstrative of the colonial logics at play in the British government's management of this health crisis. The government's response is to allow swathes of its population to die, leaving it with the highest excess death rate in the world. At the time Johnson decided to follow this policy, it was widely understood that the virus was particularly dangerous for older people and those with underlying health conditions. Johnson treated vulnerable people as surplus population, acceptable sacrifices so that Britain could remain open for business. This dangerous position was exacerbated by a combination of arrogance and racism on the part of officials who considered the virus to be something happening over there to people who are not white, not European, not British, and who didn't matter. The assumption was that it would not reach Britain and that if it did, Britain would be better placed to deal with it. And now as people are dying in their tens of thousands, they fudge the figures and hide the bodies. The murderous combination of exceptionalism, complacency and eugenics is not new to British rule. Such features comprised an important part of colonial real rule in the era of the British Empire. Subjects were left to die as famines took hold, as illness spread, as people's land and livelihoods were taken from them. Colonial authorities deployed a let die logic laced with ideas of white superiority, seeing illness and famine as nature's way of dealing with populations deemed surplus. And of course, those to suffer disproportionately are racialized people always and already disproportionately at risk of targeted state terror, abandonment or murder. So to conclude, I just want to say a few words about Europe since this, its study is central in the report. And because Luke and Guy write that it is an open question whether the European Union can continue to function or even exist if its members do not share the same principles in limiting the exercise of executive power. To my mind, it is little surprise that the project of European integration has been unable to provide an adequate alternative to the excesses of the nation state or serve as a counterweight to the instances of rising authoritarianism across the continent so well documented in the report. As European nations turn further inward, the harmful effects um, of their past and present global exploits are felt across the world, just as they echo violently within their own borders. Just like Britain, Europe's appeal to notions of freedom, democracy, and human rights have always coexisted with imperial wars and dispossession. Its founders drew on traditions that were undemocratic, militaristic, imperialistic, white, and Christian supremacist. Counter to the well-rehearsed account of the history of, the Euro of European integration as having been embarked upon in the interests of lasting peace and security in the wake of the Second World War, it was also a desperate attempt by European colonial powers to regroup in the face of threats to their global supremacy. This was captured by former Belgian Prime Minister Paul-Henri Spark speaking on the occasion of the establishment of the Council of Europe in 1948, when he said, 100, 150 million Europeans have not the right to feel inferior to anyone. Do you hear? There is no great country in this world that can look down on 150 million Europeans who close their ranks in order to save themselves. Similarly in Britain, similarly as Britain, the origins of the European Union thus lie in a turn towards protectionism in an effort to steal off, to seal off stolen riches in the face of the defeat of European colonialism worldwide. I suppose my hope is that if we as critical scholars, teachers and activists can work together to provide urgently needed counter histories and narratives to those offered by mainstream political discourse, we might begin to work our way out of the violence and ensnarement of the nation state and its dangerous counterpart of authoritarian nationalism. Thank you. Thanks very much, Nadine. And I will go straight on to Charlene. Are you mute, Charlene? Oh, I've just unmuted myself. <laughs> Thank you. I hope I'm audible. So uh, thanks very much, um, Luke and uh, Guy for the report and Mary for the invitation to join you um, uh, this afternoon. Um, 
in a way, I feel a little awkward saying uh, I agree with a lot of your analysis of authoritarianism because the four axes along which you analyze it, all four of them come from the talk I gave at the seminar we held at the LSE. Uh, the idea of toxic masculinities, crony capitalism, ethnic uh, uh, nationalism, and erosion of democracy, which I said, this is exactly I see as the toxic mixture of what I call soft authoritarianism. Uh, we can come back to terms. I don't think they're important. I think we're talking about the same processes. So in a sense, I would only be saying I agree with myself when I read the report. But uh, let me pick up a whole aspect of the discussion of um, what I call, as I said, soft authoritarianism. John Keane has called it in his new book, The New Despotism, uh, which I think we need to look at carefully. Um, before I do that, let me just say, uh, actually, Nadine's critique is something that I would have uh, made very much from a post-colonial uh, point of view uh, in pointing out uh, the whole uh, mythology around Britain's own past, which uh, is Britain's uh, self-representation today, which we see is being really radically questioned now by some of the uh, uh, street protests. But Nadine's done such a fantastic job of that. So I'm going to uh, go um, uh, for to make two sets of comments and two questions. One, the virus of soft authoritarianism. I think what is interesting about that authoritarianism is that it is less violent, it is less spectacular than what we were used to in the past uh, because it keeps a, a modicum of democratic procedures intact without actually subscribing to any liberal institutional um, values and uh, principles. So it, there is a problem about how to detect it. What is the level at which we could really um, uh, find out uh, the kinds of practices which go into the making of this new phenomenon, uh, however we want, may want to uh, call it. So I think one is for me a methodological question uh, rather than a terminological one. Um, uh, so that I don't think there's much at stake for me whether we want to call it uh, soft authoritarianism or new despotism. But I think the question is methodologically, how do we research this phenomenon? And I think that's something we need to think about because what we need to do is to really do get good ethnographies of the practices of these regimes to see what the similarities and differences are if we want to figure out a way of how we are going to be able to mobilize against them. They are resilient regimes and I think they're very attractive uh, for a lot of people and we need to understand why. Uh, these are cunning states, as I have argued, um, entirely unaccountable, uh, passionate about power for the sake of power. Uh, ideologically, I don't think they share necessarily very much, uh, but what they do share is that they have no interest in power sharing. What they do is they rule by administrating doses of fear and anxiety and polarizing populations. But I think what makes it really um, difficult to um, come up with good uh, strategies to deal with them are three features of these regimes, which I think we need to think about carefully together. One, I feel that they are not necessarily copying one another, though, although sometimes you do have the feeling looking at India and Turkey that they are taking a leaf out of Orban's book, just as you have the feeling sometimes Orban in Hungary is taking a leaf out of Putin's book. But I think what binds them together is the fact that they are all of them, each one of them doing despotism promotion abroad. So instead of the old democracy promotion, we are getting a lot of promotion by these authoritarian regimes of their brands of authoritarianism abroad. So look at Russia and Syria, China all over um, uh, Africa, look at the US in uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, but these are not 
just the governments which are doing a promotion of despotism, but it's also large parts of, for example, in the US, the armament industry, which has a huge interest in keeping alive the kind of military conflicts that we have just been talking mm -hmm. about. Nadine has also alluded uh, to them. Secondly, I think the major problem is that there are very close ties between new despots uh, and uh, old democratic uh, regimes which are in a sense bound together, if you like, by companies like uh, McKinsey's, which have been actively supporting large state-owned corporations in Turkey, in Saudi Arabia, in Russia, in China. And I think we need to really examine much, much more carefully the nexus between corporations and these states. So crony capitalism is one part of the story, but this is another part of the story that we um, uh, really need to uh, look at very carefully. Thirdly, we need to look at some of the tactics they are using at home. So we've seen a lot of the militarization of uh, police um, uh, forces. We're seeing that every day in the US on display uh, in the streets. But this is true of almost all of these regimes the world over, which makes it very, very difficult, especially under COVID to organize street protest, protests, because I think um, there's going to be a problem about how to organize civil society in conditions when there has been so much of a clampdown on uh, dissent and on uh, autonomous uh, media uh, who are under threat in all kinds of ways. Let me come to my second point very quickly, and that is, I don't know if you've had a look at the new survey done by the European Council of Foreign Relations, which came out, I think, a week ago or so. Uh, it's a survey of nine countries, um, uh, Poland, Italy, uh, Bulgaria, uh, Sweden, Germany, uh, Spain, so a lot of the countries that you also deal with in the report, and it's a survey of about 11,000 citizens who have been asked uh, a, a number of uh, questions. Three findings seem to me to be interesting because in a way they are a little bit at a, a disjunct with some of the findings in your report. One of the findings that uh, uh, they have is that uh, what is, uh, it, it's not as if public support for the straight state has been strengthened, uh, neither has support for expertise been strengthened because of uh, Corona. Interestingly, people see the state in a sense much more as an insurance mechanism, a stockpiling state, which should stockpile food and medicines, but otherwise, for example, the survey shows for France, there's a 61% decrease in the confidence of people in the government. On the whole across Europe, huge decline in people's trust in their governments and the, uh, very little idea, feeling that the governments have done a good job. In fact, also, except for Denmark and Sweden and uh, uh, Germany in the other countries, uh, in Poland and Spain, um, et cetera, uh, dis distrust of experts. Experts seen as being um, uh, instrumentalized by governments, experts also being seen as being used by governments to justify policy rather than to uh, inform them. Uh, the second finding, uh, which is interesting, is that in a sense there seems to be some kind of a scrambling of the disjunction between or the difference between nationalism and uh, globalism. Uh, so what uh, the survey is, uh, is showing and the report written by uh, Ivan Krastev and Mark Leonard on the survey is arguing is that um, if the refugee crisis led to ethnic nationalism coming to the forefront, the COVID crisis led to a territorial nationalism, which was not necessarily uh, an ethnic nationalism, because foreigners in the countries were given the same protection, although a lot of citizens were kept out for health reasons. So it's a more complicated story here than just the migrant citizen divide, although we've seen a lot of hostility towards migrants as well. But what they point out too is that it's in a very paradoxical fashion, um, there is a lot of support for what they call strategic sovereignty for a new European project. Although people feel let down by the EU, people feel the EU was extremely irrelevant to their lives and in helping them in this crisis, 
Nevertheless, they feel given the choice, 42% of those surveyed uh, say that given the choice between a world uh, dominated either by the US or by China, the uh, Europeans have no other choice but to form a stronger bloc. So I think there may be a good moment to think about a genuine reform of um, uh, EU institutions in the sense of progressive protectionism, because what seems to be the case is that both on the digital and the climate agenda, you seem to have a lot of support both for carbon taxes and digital taxes among all those uh, surveyed. So let me stop at that because I think the question I would like to then put to you is, where do you think we should be finding the political constituencies and support for these progressive agendas across Europe and also, of course, more uh, globally? But the question that the ECFR survey doesn't ask, so it doesn't answer, but on you put your finger on it in the report is the question, what are we going to do about growing inequalities? And it doesn't seem to me that there is so much of public support for decreasing those um, uh, inequalities uh, through public action or a large kind of support for putting the common good in uh, um, um, uh, up front, uh, as Luke put it, uh, can we reshape the balance of power uh, between uh, capital and labor? Uh, Trade unions do not seem to be um, uh, strong actors anymore. Political parties uh, on the left have uh, are showing a decline all over uh, Europe, the social democratic parties. So the question would be what kinds of political formations and constellations can we try and build up for a, a progressive agenda, not only on climate, on um, uh, reigning in the power of monopolies, digital monopolies, but especially to tackle the questions of the fault lines of inequality, which COVID has laid bare. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shalini. And that was a fascinating overview by everybody of the current situation. Although I would say perhaps a little bit too depressing <laughs> because I do think there are openings at the moment. And I'd like to make one comment. I have lots more, but just for time reasons, I'd like to make one comment before I ask Luke and Guy if they want to respond and then we go over to the questions. Um, so my point really is about this argument about deglobalization, which seems to be widely accepted, not just by you two. And of course, in an obvious sense, if you define globalization in a very conventional, narrow sense as trade and financial flows, then of course it's true. But those of us who've spent years thinking about globalization do think about globalization as something more than that. It's about global interconnectedness, especially uh, as a result of the use of internet and all of those things. But it's also, and I, for me, that's the most important meaning. It's about global consciousness. It's about thinking of yourself as a human being and being part of human society. And it seems to me that this crisis, and then of course, there's another meaning of globalization, which is actually what most of the meanings tend to assume which is we think of globalization as beyond the stake. And it seems like the state is back. But it seems to me that actually, if you think of globalization as something more than those narrow meanings, actually it's not clear what this crisis has done. I mean, just the fact that we are talking on Zoom <laughs> and that online communication has enormously increased as a result of the crisis and LSE events are no longer confined to people in London. But I don't know how many people there are watching this event who are miles away, but LSE events have become much more transnational as a consequence. And then we see, I would say, despite the clampdown on civil society, we see this enormous outpouring over Black Lives Matter which is a really significant, I think, transnational social movement. And if we think about the state, it's true 
that public authority is back, that people expect our authorities to act, as Shalini said, as an insurance mechanism and to protect us. But it's not clear to me that it's the state. Look at America. Trump is making all these ridiculous remarks, but most of the support, most of the anti-COVID measures are being taken at state level. Even in Britain, we're finding this is a moment that, oh, I thought I turned it off. Um, we're finding that devolution um, is much more apparent now when Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland seem to have their own strategies. And in most places, there's a growing emphasis on decentralization and local community. But it's also the case, I think, that uh, global institutions, even if people like Trump have withdrawn support, for example, from the World Health Organization, the World Health Organization has become much more present in our consciousness. And similarly, I think what happens to the European Union is hugely important. So I'm, while I think it's true that we all feel public authority is back, it's not clear to me that that public authority is necessarily at the level of the state. And it seems to me that's the other common sense meaning of globalization. So when you use a term multilateralist deglobalization, it sounds to me rather old fashioned. It sounds to me, let's have the state back, but involve ourselves in international institutions. I think what we need is something much more than that. I think we need accountable international institutions or global institutions. Mm -hmm. We need them to act to balance the nation state. We need sort of human rights interventions. We need the European Union. We need the World Health Organization to have much more clout than it does. And it's not gonna just get that clout from the state. We need to invent mechanisms through which citizens and civil society can have an influence on institutions. So I suppose my argument would be, this is an opening for that. I'm not denying all the absolutely correct arguments that you've all made about how it's an opportunity for authoritarianism. But I also think it's a huge opportunity for the other and we should pull out the other as much as we can. Uh, it, and, and one last point about the other is, I think what's extraordinary is the state does feel responsible for human beings which is actually historically classically new. I mean, even China couldn't cover up the, um, uh, the, the pandemic, even though it had covered up numerous famines in the past and covered up the Uyghurs and everything else. So my feeling is there's a real sense and that, you know, and I agree with what Nadine says about the armed forces, but on the other hand, who are the key workers today? The armed forces are trying to rush in on the act, but we're all celebrating health workers, not soldiers. And that's a huge paradigmatic change. So those were my comments. I'm not going to say more, just very briefly. Uh, Luke and Guy, do you want to respond to anything anybody said? Uh, yeah, great. Um, shall I go first and then say, so, uh, great. So, uh, yeah, so I'll go to Shalini first. Uh, thank you for the ideas, as you commented. Um, I, I agree with, you know, the pitch of soft authoritarianism. I think the direction I would like to take this concept and this idea or find a heuristic that captures the link between climate change, uh, social inequality and the new authoritarianism, because I think it's on those issues <clears throat> where uh, which are so epochal in this century to deal with so significant i think it's there where, where the authoritarianism not in the same way in every country there's massive differences and divergences but there where it really stands in the way of effectively dealing with them from climate denial on the one hand um, in the most extreme forms like donald trump but even where it doesn't involve climate denial the very mobilization and primacy of nationalism itself is an obstacle to tackling climate change um, I haven't read the ECFR report you've mentioned yet, but I certainly will do. And I think that this question of who is the constituency to address social inequality is 
of clearly the critical one. I think we definitely need a modern conception of what labor is. So labor is not the trade unions, labor is also the social movements, it's also public society. So it's, it's labor small L in the broad sense that I think would see as the constituency. We don't actually discuss it in the report, but we have I have talked about it in another report um, with this idea of our, our LSE colleague, uh, Andres Rodriguez Pozes idea of um, geographies of discontent. I find this very, as an explanation for the rise of populism in Europe, I find this a very persuasive, uh, it's economic geography and it's quite quantitative based, but I find the argument very persuasive and um, because he points out it is the places that don't matter, as he puts it, not the people that don't matter, i.e. in many of the towns and small cities um, across Europe where authoritarian populism has really um, taken root, it's often middle class people that come to the call of authoritarian populism, but it's in areas that have experienced socioeconomic uh, decline. And I think it's that dynamic that gives you some idea of how you would go about fixing it by creating more equitable equality on a regional level as well as on a class um, level. Um, and on Nadine's uh, uh, brilliant uh, account of post-colonialism and uh, the role of empire in the construction of bordering, I'll definitely encourage uh, the audience to go out and buy the book. Um, look, I, I agree, but I would add the a caveat or another way of putting at it as well that's quite influenced by uh, David Edgerton he's got a Guardian article out uh, this week where he makes this point but it's also in his book the rise and the fall of the British nation and I find his argument quite persuasive too and he says well yes there is um, uh, the role of colonialism is so important as a lineage for contemporary British racism, but we should be careful with this argument because we should also draw out the uh, racism that was present in, if you like, the, the, the post-colonial as a stage, post-1945 British development, the racism that existed in the, pro in the project of creating a post-colonial Britain. And, you know, the, the, he's talking about things like um, the uh, sweeping spirit of 1945 nationalizations, uh, the way in which these were racialized, and the way in which the project of British nationalism and fascism, yes, it seems to, in some ways, draw on this terrible colonial melancholy, colony, uh, melancholy, um, but then in other ways, um, it's also about and what has been historically about a rejection of the presence of colonial subjects from the empire in Britain. And this was really important to the National Front and so on in, in the 1980s. So I think there's parts of that contradiction that are present in the Brexit project. You know, what is it? Like, is it a project of national discovery or formation or whatever? Or is it a project of, of colonial one? And um, then finally, on Mary's... Uh, uh, argument. Yes, look, I agree that there are profound tendencies to cultural globalization, and there have been for a very long time, and, and indeed that these will not go away. I think my hesitancy around the question when talking about the rise of authoritarianism is that I feel that cultural globalization does not offer much protection from authoritarian um, globalization. Um, and I think, so sorry to use positivist language, but I think it's like a kind of what you could call a second order consideration when it comes to the rise of the contemporary authoritarianism, because we have mountains of evidence, I think, qualitative, quantitative, and, you know, anecdotal personal experience that shows that people who have had mountains of uh, bucket loads of cultural globalization will often be here, be the first to hear the call of authoritarian um, nationalism. You know, I'm thinking here, I have, you know, a colleague of mine from an institution I used to work at once commented to me at the time of the last French presidential elections that at her daughter's um, school, many of the parents who are living in London and in her words, um, enjoyed the cosmopolitan lifestyle that London offered, saw no contradiction between that cultural globalization and voting for Marine Le Pen.
against Macron saw the two things as somehow you know compatible with one another or that their or that their migration status was allowed them to adopt this position of if you like white supremacy towards France and um, we similarly know that Trump voters who were on average much you know five thousand dollars wealthier than uh, Hillary Clinton voters you know when they many of those voters would have traveled to the world but see that in no contradiction that process of cultural globalization um to to to, to backing the politics of america first um in the united states and I, I, and if we can go you know further back i think this has some resonances say with the belle epoque of the late 18th and, 19, and uh, late 19th and early 20th centuries you know a profound moment of cultural globalization, the European uh, festivals, the festival of uh, the, the infamous colonial festival in Paris in 1902, you know, these were, these were clearly great events for European cosmopolitan is an in, in quite cosmopolitanism in quite a colonial and racist form, but they didn't stop the drive to the First World War in 1914. So in the end, you, I think I feel that in relation to this question, um, cultural globalization can be mobilized by both sides or, or, or it can be ca capitalized on by both sides. And I suppose finally, what's interesting about China and ch contemporary Chinese authoritarianism is that unlike Donald Trump and his brand of uh, political nationalism, China supports an integrated multilateral global order. It wants to keep the, 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 sh the show on the road as much as possible. Okay, I didn't really mean cultural globalization. I meant interconnectedness actually. But anyway, I won't abuse my position to get into an argument with you. So we can talk about it later. But yeah, yeah, Guy, yeah. would you like to say something? Yeah, uh, yeah thank you. So there's so many interesting threads that I could pull out there, but I'm just going to try and keep it quite brief. So firstly, with Nadine, I mean, I completely agree with you and thank you for sort of pointing out the continuity in British authoritarian policy and the implication of colonialism in bordering and on the practice of bordering more generally and how that's going to play out in the UK. It's interesting to reflect on that. So of course, Johnson, in some ways, he's avoided the more extreme anti-migrant rhetoric that we've seen with people like Salvini, who's one of the most conspicuous attempts to blame immigrants and China for the virus. And likewise, Bolsonaro and Trump have engaged in anti-China rhetoric. But we have seen, I think, with policies like the mandatory quarantine that flies in the face of scientific um, need and evidence, a kind of populist anti-migrant sentiment that they do stand ready to exploit opportunistically um, this government. So I do think we need to be on the alert for the way in which this is going to be uh, used by nationalists to demand a closure of borders. And one of the other things which hasn't been commented on um, a great deal as far as I know is one thing that is very worrying is the way in which the new surveillance infrastructure that is being assembled can be used to strengthen everyday bordering practices within the state, the, the governance of irregular migrants. The, um, we're already seeing in the UK that the way in which public services, nurses, doctors, university lecturers are being implicated in bordering. Um, and if we have this drive towards uh, tracking people wherever they go and the demands that they present ID and all these kinds of things, if they go to the pub, then that's gonna be very dangerous for um, uh, people who who are sort of undocumented and it's going to be another way in which the border regime gets strengthened and, and in relation to the id question as well this brings to a second point that i didn't mention that i could have caught attention to in the tory manifesto which is the uh the proposal to introduce voter id laws um and this disproportionately targets black and minority ethnic people it disproportionately targets uh, precarious people students people who tend to vote labor and as Shalini was saying, there's a kind of mutual learning. Um, the Republicans, it's been very successful for them in suppressing uh, the African-American vote in the US. And we could be about to face a similar um, development here if, if the Tories do get their way with the voter ID laws as well. So, I mean, there's a number of uh, worrying developments. There's also, I mean, more optimistically, as, as Mary said, there was this kind of narrative of migrants being involved in the NHS, migrants being key workers, 
and migrants being part of the kind of territorial national community, as Shalini says. They, again, there's the danger there of playing into this narrative of the good migrant who gets rewarded for their uh, services to us, and rather than it being a matter of fundamental human rights and entitlements, which is what we should care about. But absolutely, we should be emphasizing the as a counterpart to this uh, deglobalization in economic terms and opening up of borders and uh, exchange across borders. And I think that's a, a fundamentally a human rights issue as well. Um, on, on the question briefly then of, sort of human rights, there's a, there's a very interesting essay that Anthony Barnett wrote on open democracy, where he argues that underlying the emergence of globalization, there's been this kind of undercurrent of what he calls humanization which is a slightly awkward term, but it calls attention to the way in which the discourse of human rights has really become popularised. I mean, the most amazing thing, like Mary says, about the lockdown is that it happened at all. I mean, in 1968, there was a epidemic and, you know, 600,000 people, I think, around that number died uh, across the world in 1968. There was no talk of shutting down uh, the market in order to save lives. That just wasn't on the agenda. But now people are obviously valuing the human right to health, and we see that the human right to health can only exist in a meaningful sense if you have the right to shelter. That's why the government, even the Tories, are being forced to uh, house the homeless. It can only um, have a human right to health if you have a human right to food. Marcus Rashford was able to successfully push back against the Tories on this policy of cutting free school meals. So we're seeing the independence of the human right to health, the human right to life, with other rights, and the way in which that can only be guaranteed by um, an effective state. So that provides one possible avenue, I think, that can be um, built on. Um, Shalini's point about this report of the, the, the European Council on Foreign Relations, isn't it? I mean, that's, I did briefly look at the report on that in The Guardian. I find it completely fascinating, especially this question about expertise. And I guess there's the worry that experts seem to be co-opted by the political establishment. If you look at, is it Chris Vitti and uh, Patrick Valance in the UK? I mean, their integrity, their authority has certainly been called into question in the way that the government is using them and deploying them. And, you know, that could go in one of two directions. If it's in a bad direction, we're going to see more conspiracy theories, more disdain for expertise of the kind you see in these kind of populist movements. Um, or it could go in a more positive direction where we demand more transparency, more accountability and more democratic um, oversight of, of these kind of technocrats and experts. So again, there's different possible ways in which that one could play out. But, um, you know, how it's going to help populists, I don't know. And it depends if they're in power or not. Uh, Marine Le Pen could do very well out of it. Macron's support has gone down quite significantly. But then obviously Trump and Bolsonaro, they seem to be uh, faring much worse given they're the ones in power. So it's very different. And it, what's interesting as well that so you can highlight in the report, there's no uniform response by authoritarian nationalists or populists to this crisis. And they seem to be experimenting with different approaches to the lockdown. Sometimes they say it's too authoritarian. Sometimes they say it's too permissive and they don't seem to have a kind of consistent line on it, which just, I suppose, reflects partly their opportunism more than anything. But um, I think I'll leave it there and there might be other, other comments or questions. Yeah, I think it reflects the fact that they literally don't care. And so whatever they do is only opportunistic, as you say. So finally, we get to the questions and answers and we have 25 minutes for this. So I'm going to start by reading out three questions and then whoever wants to answer can answer. So the first question comes from Mitali Mishra an LSE law student who's currently in India. A good example of what I meant about transnationalism. Um, and she says, some governments have announced suspending labor laws for a while after the pandemic to stimulate business after the pandemic. Will the pandemic lead to a post-capitalist world or to a hyper-capitalist world? What would this mean for our human rights? I have to say, I think you've all been talking about that all the time but you might have specific answers. And then, how do I do this? I'm trying to get, then the next question comes from David McBurnley, um, who's from 
the open government uh, network. Oh no, who, who, NI, I don't know what NI means. Anyway, he says, the open government network, the dangers ahead is an excellent paper that covers a lot of ground and countries. In the, is the EU as prone to authoritarian austerity, crony capitalism and state dependent capitalism and lack of transparency and accountability as nation states? This is for Luke and Guy. And then finally, Lavina Vithilingam from Herefordshire call for all speakers. Authoritarian and populist governments around the world have dealt really badly with the coronavirus, and this has resulted in large numbers of people dying. Responsible governments have had better results. Is this an indication that populations are going to reject authoritarian and populist governments as being totally inept? So all of three questions in a way cover ground, but I'm going to let Charlene start. Okay, thank you very much. So let me pick up two of the questions, the one on India and the last one, which you just talked about. I think the interesting thing is we do not see a uniformity of responses, which we can categorize as responses of um, authoritarian uh, governments versus those of democratic ones. So China, um, uh, which uh, um, was very successful um, at uh, curbing, uh, despite all the disinformation, uh, despite all their bullying and threats of withholding medical supplies, etc., which didn't do very much to uh, endear China to us, despite all the mask diplomacy which they then tried, but their own um, uh, containment was uh, successful. Um, uh, so you have an authoritarian government which succeeded very well at containing uh, COVID. On the other hand, you had uh, New Zealand, Germany, Austria, uh, where I am at the moment, Vienna, uh, um, a democratic uh, governments which were equally successful at it. And then you have two major democratic governments failing miserably, and that is the United Kingdom and the US. Uh, but as you see, um, Brazil uh, is doing an equally poor job uh, of it. So the authoritarian democracy, the, uh, the regime divide, the regime type divide, to be more precise, doesn't seem to map on easily to which government succeeded uh, well or not. I think one thing which seems to have played a role is uh, populism. So right wing populist leaders, whether authoritarian or democratic, are all done badly. So Trump, Bolsonaro, Boris Johnson. Secondly, women leaders seem to have all done well. New Zealand, um, uh, Denmark, uh, uh, Finland, no, not Denmark, Finland, uh, Germany. So there seem to be some other kinds of patterns here that we need to look at, but obviously all governments where citizens had trust have done well and within India, and let me come to the Indian one, I think the interesting thing is the huge variance between Indian states. Kerala has done surprisingly well uh, with a death rate which is lower. Uh, in fact, the infection rate which is very high to begin with because it is highly globally interconnected because of a very high um, a number of immigrants, etc. cetera, uh, but it flattened the curve faster than everybody else in India. It went into a lockdown sooner than in India, extremely good public health infrastructure, extremely good press briefings, very, very uh, responsive administration, uh, uh, population which is uh, educated, literate, um, and a lot of um, uh, political mobilization to make administration responsive over the years. So it's a public administration which has always dealt well with any kind of crises, be it the floods a couple of years ago or this public health crisis. So uh, the, the discrepancies within India are really, really striking. Bombay doing it badly, Delhi doing extremely badly, et cetera. So I won't go into uh, that, but I think the interesting thing is to try and understand, and I think it's a bit too early to uh, be able to analyze all the factors, but the interesting thing is to do very close analysis of what is um, uh, behind these uh, differences. To um, Mithili's uh, question, uh, more, I think two things very quickly to it. Uh, 
I think one of the really um, interesting um, uh, observations in the Indian case is the enormous visibilization of labor migrants through COVID. So the millions of unorganized construction workers, domestic workers, people working in the hospitality industry in India, who were totally, uh, 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 the middle classes in India were totally oblivious to their presence, the people who ran their cities and their homes. Uh, the fact that they were forced to migrate, forced out of the cities, back home to the villages for lack of any public support, um, made suddenly um, everyone aware of the fact uh, of the extent of, so it's 450 million uh, workers that we are talking about who are in the informal sector in India without any social protection um, and uh, without any job security. And millions of them, I mean, I saw one estimate at 100 million, another at 180 million rendered unemployed. No savings, no wages, no public support. So uh, this, I think the whole question of citizen rights versus migrant rights as we pose it in Europe must be posed very differently in a country like India because these are all Indian citizens. Uh, the fact that they are migrant in India, however, has one interesting commonality with migrants in Europe. They are all politically disenfranchised. In India, you do not have voting rights as a migrant <laughs> in the city in which you live because you only have voting rights related to residence, not re to, to your uh, uh, place of origin. So they are basically not voting, they are politically disenfranchised within their country. I mean, apart from the fact that they are poor, they are illiterate, etc. So I think it makes a huge difference. So we come back to Albert Hirschman's story. I mean, whose voice can be heard, but that voice needs to be channelized politically into a voice which can be organized in certain forms and all of them have no voice politically. So this is a very interesting uh, point which we note. And then just two very quick, um, the suspension of labor laws. So industry immediately moved to say, we've done no business in the last two or three months because of the lockdown. So not only should uh, taxes that we pay for the welfare of these into the welfare funds, so there is a building workers and construction workers fund, uh, the, um, the construct builders, big builders, large building companies were paying 1% um, of the project building project costs into that welfare fund. And their first instinct was not to say, let's use the money because it's all lying unused, which is a different story in these funds. But their first instinct was to say, lots not pay any more taxes because we haven't done any building construction. So they, they are trying to dilute all the tax laws which apply to them, all the building laws which apply to them. Will it lead to a post-capitalist world? I am more pessimistic than Mary always, so I will end on a pessimistic note here, unfortunately. I think uh, that there is, I see little signs in India of a new balance between labor and capital, which will be uh, in favor of uh, labor. Um, I think the capitalists will uh, come back to using all their clout to say business as usual, uh, the economy has suffered huge losses. And I think in many other countries, and with that I'll close, I think to come back to the question of multilateral institutions, which we touched on earlier, I think the major reason why we need um, responsive, and as Mary rightly says, accountable uh, public uh, multilateral um, international institutions at the moment is to organize the largest debt relief that we can think of for the poorer countries in the world. Their infrastructures, especially the health infrastructure, has been dismantled through years of structural adjustment, decades of structural adjustment and austerity programs. So in our own interest, we need to make sure that public health infrastructures everywhere again are well-funded. And I think the WHO will play an interesting role in the vaccine mm -hmm. uh, because there it's interesting, China agreed with the EU against the US uh, that the vaccine, even if a Chinese company manufactures it, should be a public good. Thank, Gosh, you. thank you, that was really interesting. And I have actually a follow-up question, but I'm not gonna put it because of time. Luke or Guy, because we've got a few more questions and if we have time, I'd quite like to give the questions and then have you all reply. Do you want to say something at this point or shall I ask the other questions? 
Nobody's answering. Sorry, but... sorry, Mary, I was muted. Um, I think the question from, um, uh, excuse my pronunci pronunciation, Abhijitja Subramanian, um, an incoming LSE student would be interesting. And uh, okay. yeah, but I agree with asking a couple. Um, is that a question that's on the Q and A or one? That... Yeah, it is. It shall I just read it out? Um, given the yeah. nature of our capital captured democracy, that means the alternative to these nationalist politicians are liberal, laissez-faire, globalist. Oh, it's just disappeared. Um, <laughs> politicians that continue to perpetuate the sort of economic and educational inequality that leads to people voting for nationalists. How do we escape from this cycle of centre ground liberals, authoritarian centre ground liberals? I think that's worth talking about um okay that's great i will just read a couple more and then i'll go to all of you starting with nadine okay so there's one i'm not going to read them all there's one from tom lines who's in brighton like me hello tom um and he's a retired lecturer and consultant was an eventual turn to authoritarianism probably with an ethnic link, an inherent consequence of neoliberalism, like the fascism of the 1930s, which followed the 1929 crash, in turn a product of decades of laissez-faire economics. Some people have protected both during the 40 years of neoliberalism. Is this just facile historicism? And then, um, I think, Actually, I'll leave it there, but I'll just ask one question myself, which is, especially to Shalini, although I'm going to start with Nadine, which is, is China a diff does China fit this model of ethnic nationalism, crony capitalism, <laughs> and masculinity? And does that mean China's different? In which case we could argue that all the new authoritarians have been inept. Um, but the responses have been different because in both India and China, for example, the initiatives have, and the United States, for example, the initiatives have been taken at state level rather than at national level. But there might be a, maybe not a changing balance between capital and labor, but a changing balance uh, in political authority. So, Guy, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, sure. Okay, I can start. So, we've got 10 minutes, so if you could each... Oh, I'll be really quick. I mean, just a few observations. So on the kind of uh, alternatives to neoliberal economics and the role of the state, I mean, one of the things that's been really striking as well about the coronavirus lockdown is the emergence of sort of grassroots organisations and mutual aid networks. So... I mean, this is something that my colleagues at Loughborough, there's a big anarchist research network at Loughborough, and they've been studying the emergence of mutual aid. And I don't know about you, but it's sort of on my street, I'm part of a WhatsApp group that's about 70 people, where people are kind of providing for one another, people who need welfare support, people who need help in some way. So I'd be very interested to the extent in which those kind of networks persist once we start leaving lockdown. I mean, it would be interesting. I don't think it's ultimately a substitute for uh, the role of the state, but that is going to be interesting in how that plays out. Um, the other thing we haven't talked about much is obviously the ecological dimension of all this. The coronavirus crisis is part of our intrusion into the natural world. It's about our cross-species contamination of uh, the, the source of this virus. And we really need to think about the, the, the big issue to come, which is climate change. If anything, this is a dress rehearsal for that. So when we talk about the crisis of capitalism, that's inextricably linked to this question of how we deal with climate change. I agree with Shalini, in the short term, you're gonna see probably lots of slashing of environmental regulations in the name of national competitiveness to get the economy moving again. And, and to counterpose to that, the left needs some kind of convincing narrative Absolutely. about how to address the climate issue. I mean, in, in France, Mélenchon talks about ecological collectivism and, uh, you know, a sort of strong state, something like a Green New Deal. Uh, Starmer in this country seems to be wobbling about whether he's going to back a Green New Deal because he's worried about it wasn't popular enough at the last election. <laughs> That's obviously um, 
the crucial issue is, is it the right thing to do? And mm -hmm. yes, it is for the future of the species. So there should be no um, hesitation about adopting that as a, a, a policy for, for a, any political party. Nadine. Thanks, I'll, I'll keep it brief because I, I want to give um, the other speakers a chance to respond. And also because, um, you know, I'm, I feel uh, ready and able to comment on causes and structures which produce the kind of patterns that we're seeing today and the tendencies that we're seeing today. What I feel less able to do is predict the future. And I think that one reason or why I find that particularly difficult in this moment is that we are still living in the time of the pandemic. We're not post pandemic. People are um, still dying um, across the world and in unnecessary preventable numbers. And I feel the way that a, um, a colleague and friend of mine, Sita Balani, wrote in a recent piece um, that the sort of rush towards a future dawn is a symptom of our inability to live with the pandemic, to live within its warped temporality. And so I suppose whilst we're still within the moment of catastrophe, I find thinking beyond it um, challenging, but also potentially inhibiting of um, our resistance now in the moment to what is happening um, around us as we even speak and have this event. And I think that leads me on to say that this is not me being not optimistic or not hopeful. It is more, um, just uh, it is more a, a kind of uh, perceived need to actually still tackle the very real everyday challenges that we're ha ha having and facing now um, uh, rather than sort of think bigger and, and blue sky immediately and I think I'd like to just sort of maybe comment on what Guy just said about mutual aid and support which is one thing that I think is um, has been a really powerful and moving at times response by neighbors um, working together to fill a gap that the state wasn't willing to or not able to fill. And I think that those bonds, um, they're not just a sort of um, response to a need to provide resources that are lacking, but actually grow to be bonds of friendship and love and support. These are emotional bonds that can't just be broken. Uh, they can't be co-opted. They can't be damaged. They can't be destroyed. And the state attempted with its NHS volunteers, et cetera, to co-opt those um, groups, but it failed to do that, um, possibly just because it was operationally um, useless. Um, but I feel that the bonds that have been made on, on my street and between my neighbors are things that will never be taken away and, and they will never be able to be broken um, by the state. And there's a level of, I suppose, politicization in that, but it's about seeing love and seeing care as, as political, as, as political acts of resistance in this moment that the, that the state can, can never take back from us. So, I mean, I suppose that would be my sort of hopeful note to end on. That's great. Uh, Luke. Um, yeah, I, I, I feel terrible to come to the defense of Keir Starmer on, on, on this, but I feel, I feel I have to because that specific comment that has been attributed to him was about the net 2030 um, target. So given that the next general election um, is likely to take place in 2024, like that would mean um, an extraordinary uh, six years to achieve a net uh, 2030 climate emissions. I'm totally um, cautious um, around the new Labour leadership. I hope very much that they don't move away from the Green New Deal and a host of other policies. But I mean, Ed Miliband, the business secretary, shadow business secretary, is a big supporter of the of the Green um, New Deal. And I think that links to this uh, centre ground liberals authoritarianism cycle because question, because here well, I think we can be a little bit more, afford to be a little bit more optimistic, um, not um, around, in my, to my view, the, a reduced threat from authoritarianism, as Shalini just outlined. Um, but I think that there is limited um, structural capacity in the system to kind of reinvent and recreate a politics of the liberal centre ground in the current political moment. So I think that forces structurally when the state is bailing out such you know, vast parts of the economy, it puts the question of a socialistic, social democratic, 
response completely on the table as an almost necessity for anyone that wants to strengthen and develop uh, a democracy as an alternative to authoritarianism. Um, and the interesting question that I can't really uh, answer around, well, political authority in the European Union, um, and I think this links to the points that Mary made um, at the beginning too, and apologies if I misinterpreted the argument around cultural globalization. Um, but I, you know, I think it is easier for citizens to relate to points of authority that are closer to them. And this is a problem for the European Union because it is a new form of political authority that is state-like in some respects. It has its own currency, etc. And it is an international global governance organization, a WHO style organization in the other uh, respects. So its hybridity becomes a huge problem. Uh, or And its hybridity is both a source of strength and a source of weakness because particularly as we've seen over recent years if uh, an authoritarian nationalist you know like Orban just has a continued you know point of antagonism to use the European Union as a, a whipping um, object or for his own political uh, ends in, in, in Hungary and that argument is able to have you know some pl some plausibility or it builds upon a grain of truth because it is this strange form of political authority that does have significant sovereign uh, power in Europe and in some respects is not as democratic as it needs to be you know it, it, we've all experienced incredible frustrations with getting the European Union to move at all and um, so there are positive signs like clearly on austerity and I think again that relates to the the centre ground liberal position having less political room to manoeuvre in the current current situation. You know, who would have thought six months ago, eight months ago, that the European Union would be in the process of breaking with austerity in the way that is now being talked about? Not finally agreed, but being talked about uh, a, 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 the 750 billion euro um, program, etc. You know, that's a huge potentially exciting fighting a political shift but I you know I agree with Mary that that also has to um, be connected to new forms of democratization too that link that institution uh, to uh, European citizens at the same time and you know deals with not just um, the economic question but political injustices and here as we've discussed today the most obvious one being the complete abysmal murderous uh, border regime that exists in uh, in the Mediterranean and Aegean seas and the final point I think there was a question around authoritarian populist Cellini has answered that but it's a very small point the Greek government the Greek government is very very populist it's a very right-wing populist, populist um, government, the Mitsotakis uh, regime, and it's riding high in the opinion polls because it has uh, responded to the COVID-19 crisis very effectively um, and, you know, has pr to largely protected Greece from the worst of the fallouts. I'll be careful what I say because this is a Zoom, uh, LSE Zoom event and so on, and I don't want to um, experience a a defamation claim as a res in response to what I say. But if you want to know how bad the Greek government is, you will not find it uh, in the Guardian newspaper, unfortunately. But Google the, the name of what well, is not defamatory to say, a very close family friend of the Mitsotakis uh, family, the Maranakis uh, family. He's a big shipbuilder. You can find out what a colourful character he is from his Wikipedia page. Owns Nottingham Forest Football Club. And I dare say it is not libelous to say that this is an illustration of crony capitalism and one that academics have the freedom to discuss. So right. that will be my closing point. Great. We've actually gone over time, but we still must have the final word from Charlene. 
Do you want to follow up? I, let me just answer two uh, uh, quick uh, questions. Yours, I think, on China, Mary, I mean, I'm no China expert. I've been doing a lot of research on the use of um, unspent uh, um, special purpose funds in India, uh, which have suddenly been mobilized for COVID. So that's something I can say something about. But I think from my understanding, all my reading of China, I think China is a good example of toxic masculinity, crony capitalism, because I think you have a nexus between the party um, uh, and uh, corporations where it's very difficult to know uh, whether something is a private or a public uh, entity at all. Um, and uh, 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 phantom democracy, if you like, of exclusionary um, uh, ethnic nationalism supported by majoritarian rule. So I think uh, China uh, fits the bill well. It may, uh, on the scale of things, it may be on one extreme probably of authoritarian rule. If you're thinking of what we are now seeing in Hong Kong about the suppression of dissent or what we know about the Uyghurs, um, et cetera. But definitely I think um, that characterization would still uh, uh, fit um, the bill. I, sorry, I always come up with uh, negative examples, but you know, the, the um, new solidarities which we are seeing in India are uh, of a strange kind, I must admit. Uh, on the one hand, in the slums, you have the informal labor uh, migrants who have to go out to work, so they cannot stay in a lockdown even there, otherwise they would starve. So it's a question of, it's not health versus economy, it's just life versus is life, right? Uh, so uh, it's about if you do not earn, uh, there will be uh, starvation. So the slums in Calcutta, I'm hearing uh, uh, very interesting accounts that people have got together to support each other with water, with soap, everything which is a short supply in a normal slum household. And uh, when people enter or leave, when they come back from work, that people will be given uh, water to bathe, to uh, wash their clothes, um, uh, provided soap, etc. So there is some solidarity at that kind of level among the poor. However, a lot of the migrant workers who returned from Delhi and Bombay to their home villages were kept out of the village because people wanted them to stay on the outskirts until it was very clear that they were not infectious. So there's been that as well. Um, there's been more philanthropic, so philanthropic support to feed um, the uh, uh, migrant workers than there uh, was state support, although the state then started using up some of the accumulated funds to uh, give out uh, cash transfers. But interestingly, middle class India, which uh, is very much for this kind of lockdown uh, because they are economically not affected that much as the poor are, uh, we have seen in many, many Indian cities and gated communities, uh, vigilantism, which has made sure that none of the domestic workers are allowed to enter uh, any of these buildings or these um, uh, housing uh, complexes, uh, that they've made sure that nobody who is selling fruit, vegetable, uh, milk, etc., is allowed to come in at all. So they are policing uh, very much their own. So yes, there is mutual aid, but there is also mutual aid in keeping the poor out of their lives. Thank you so much, Shalini, and thank you to everybody, and thank you to everybody listening. Um, I think we've run out of time. Goodbye. Thank you.